Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. We're excited that so many of you are showing up now. That's really awesome. Um, so we're, um, I don't even know what the session is called anymore. Something about the commons, behavior in the commons or something like that is what we called it. Um, so we're really, we're excited that all of you are here. Um, and we're excited that that Seaway and XEcon are, are sponsoring this session. So thanks for, um, for uh, picking up our session. We're pretty excited that we get to uh, share these papers with you um, right now. Uh, what we're going to do is pretty traditional, even though none of this is really traditional, um, doing this on Zoom. Uh, what we're going to do is we have four papers, uh, so we have four presenters, and uh, we're going to go 17, 17 minutes per talk, and we're about uh, 17 to 18 minutes per talk, and we have four to five minutes of discussion after each talk. Um, what I'm going to ask you all to do is to just hold off asking you questions until the end of the talk. Just because we have so little time to get through everything, just 17 minutes, I'm just gonna, if you have questions, um, I'm just gonna ask you to, to hang on to your questions until uh, the presenters are done with their talk and then ask them at the end. Otherwise, it's just, we're just gonna run out of time and it's gonna cause all kinds of issues. Um, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna take time on my phone, so I'm gonna show that to the presenters um, when they're, I'm gonna make an announcement at 12 minutes to let them, because they might not be able to see my phone. So I'm gonna say you have five more minutes and then I'll make another announcement at uh, 17 minutes just to let them know to finish up within the next minute. Um, in terms of the schedule um, our, or in terms of the, the order in which we're gonna hear these talks, uh, we're gonna have Emily from the University of Alberta go first. Uh, then we have um, Asan from the University of Delaware He's gonna go second, myself, uh, my name is Mike. I'm at the University of Delaware, with Delaware Heavy here today. Um, I'm gonna go third. And we have Ursula uh, from the University of Nebraska uh, go last. Um, so that's the order that we're gonna go in. And we're gonna try to stick to the schedule as, as much as we can so that all of you have a busy life, I'm sure. So we're gonna try to get you out of here at, um, in an hour and a half. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and have um, Emily start uh, and share her presentation. And uh, I'm going to mute myself and uh, just look at the time. All right, you're up, Emily. Okay, let me just pull this up. Maybe, maybe. This is not what I want. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it, Emily. All ready to go. All right. I'm gonna have to look at my external monitor so you're gonna see me looking off screen, I'm sorry. Okay, let's try this again. I'm not sure why this is, there we go. Success? Go okay, yep, nice. Excellent. Okay. All right, so hey everyone. Um, my name is Emily, I'm a master's student at the University of Alberta. And uh, I'm really excited to share with you today some of my thesis research that looks at direct and indirect reciprocity in public goods games. And, well, uh oh, there we go. Um, we've seen that coordination and cooperation are challenging to achieve in public goods games. And quite often we see that um, uh, public goods are, are chronically under-provisioned. So in this paper, I'm interested in seeing if by accounting for reciprocity preferences, we can um, reach more cooperative outcomes. I do this by extending a model of reciprocity with different specifications of reciprocity. And um, today I'm gonna to be sharing the theoretical model and some predictions. And I'm gonna start with um, a definition of reciprocity, which is we should try to repay in kind what another person has provided for us. And this aligns with some other definitions that we've seen in the economics literature, including tit for tat, which is um, when players cooperate on the first move and then copy other players' preceding actions on subsequent moves, as well as conditional cooperation, in which a player's contribution is positively correlated with their beliefs about other players' contributions. So there's also different types of reciprocity. Quite often we see direct reciprocity, which is an interaction between two parties. I'm nice to you, you're nice to me. 
And this can take a simultaneous form, which is more of a matching behavior, or a sequential form, which is more of a rewarding behavior. But there's also um, indirect reciprocity, which is an interaction between three parties, and it can also take two different forms. Uh, we look at indirect upstream reciprocity, which is based on recent experience, and you can think of this as um, you are nice to me, I'm going to pay it forward and be nice to somebody else, or indirect downstream reciprocity, which is based on reputation. Um, and you can think of that as I saw you be nice to somebody, so I'm going to be nice to you. And it's important to note that reciprocity is not just an evaluation of these actions, but also an evaluation of the intention behind the action. And when we start to look at this, we need to, uh, when we start to model reciprocity in these ways, we need to start looking at beliefs. And when we consider beliefs and belief-dependent emotions, we're moving away from traditional game theory towards um, this realm of psychological games. And the framework for psychological games uh, was developed by Gina Coppolos and colleagues, and they um, stated that psychological games require their own set of appropriate solution concepts and assumptions. And Matthew Rabin applied some of these in his paper that looked at fairness considerations, incorporating fairness into players' utility functions. We're really interested in a class of models of reciprocity that focus on intentions, um, which incorporate first and higher order beliefs into a player's utility function. In particular, we look at the Dufenberg and Kirchsteiger sequential model of reciprocity. Um, and we've seen a few applications um, of this in the economics literature um, and other papers that have looked at reciprocity, but these have mostly been in a direct sense, so that two-party interaction. Um, however, recently, uh, Clark Fudenberg and Belitsky looked at um, indirect reciprocity, particularly in that uh, reputation-based sense, and did find that um, there's positive social cooperation in both a prisoner's dilemma and public goods games. So this is uh, pretty cool to see that there's direct and indirect reciprocity out there, but what our paper looks at is we look um, explicitly at direct reciprocity and two different types of indirect reciprocity and how these impact voluntary contributions in public goods games. In addition, we all are also looking at the relative role of direct versus indirect reciprocity preferences in determining these contributions. So as I mentioned, we're applying and extending the Dufenberg and Kirchsteiger model of reciprocity to public goods games with both direct and indirect reciprocity preferences. And we find support that by including reciprocity preferences, we can reach cooperative equilibria. And that these reciprocity preferences impact contribution behavior and can address the under-provisioning of public goods. So I'm gonna jump right into the model and we present an end player public goods game with a voluntary contribution mechanism. And each player has an endowment and chooses a contribution amount between zero and their full endowment. We have four different specifications for the model. We have a simultaneous baseline game. We have a sequential game in which player J is a second mover and observes the average contribution of the um, other players in set A before making their contribution choice. And then when we move to the indirect upstream reciprocity model, we have our player of interest, player J, observe the average contributions of a previous game that occurred in set in, among players in set A, and player J is also a beneficiary of this group in some way before going and playing a simultaneous game with players in their own set. And this gets to that recent experience behavior that we're interested in. And when we move to the indirect downstream case, our player of interest observes a simultaneous game, um, the average contributions of it, and whether or not some third party, party beneficiary has um, benefited from the outcome of this game. Player J then goes on and plays a simultaneous game with an n minus one random subset of players from the previous set. And this is how we get to that reputation-based um, behavior that we're interested in in indirect downstream recipro reciprocity. And because of the timing of these games, um, players will know something about the history of the game. And the history of the game can take three different forms. The history of the game can be known with certainty when it is zero or y. So that means that the player has observed the average contributions to be zero y, they know with certainty what other players have contributed. In the third case, when the history is C, the player does not know with certainty what others have contributed, just that it's somewhere between zero and y. Um, because of this, players hold uh, both first and second order beliefs in these models. Um, and a player's first order belief is the belief that player I holds about player J's contribution strategy, conditional on the history of the game. And their second order belief is the belief that player I holds about player J's belief about other players' contribution strategies. 
we apply Dufenberg and, and Kirchsteiger's sequential reciprocity equilibrium concept, which states that a profile of contribution strategies is um, a sequential reciprocity equilibrium if it is utility maximizing given beliefs um, and conditional on history. And also that these beliefs are correct in equilibrium. And that's the rational expectations assumption um, that uh, shows up in Gianna framework for psychological games as well. So when we reach um, a player's utility maximization problem in a baseline game, we see that it looks a little bit different than a traditional public goods game. So in part A here, we have our uh, material payoff function, which looks really, which is the same from a traditional public goods game, where we have the endowment minus a contribution amount, um, plus alpha is the marginal per capita return multiplied by um, the sum of contributions to the group account. And alpha has some restrictions on it to make sure that this is a social dilemma where people are really trying to figure out if they should keep their money or put it towards the group account. And part B here, this expression is the reciprocity payoff function, where R is the reciprocity preference parameter. And um, this expression here is a kindness function, which evaluates how kind player I is towards their own group. And the second expression is a perceived kindness function in which player I is evaluating how kind they perceive others in their group to be towards them. From there, we can derive uh, the player's best response function. And we see that um, their optimal strategy depends on the beliefs that they hold about other players conditional on the history of the game. And we can present the potential equilibria in a graph of reciprocity preferences against the marginal per capita return. And we see that when reciprocity preferences are quite low, that um, the outcome of the game will be the traditional public goods game Nash equilibrium. And this makes sense. If you don't care very much about being reciprocal, you're not gonna contribute anything. And what's cool is that we see when reciprocity preferences become stronger, that more cooperative outcomes can be reached. As they increase and become stronger, the social optimum can become a potential equilibrium. And when we move to the direct reciprocity specification of the model, the utility maximization problem doesn't change for the player. It's just the timing of the game that's different. So this means that the player has observed the average contribution of the other players before they're making their contribution. So in that case, they have more information about the history of the game. And um, we see some other really cool behavior happening here. Um, so the similar graph setup, and we see that when the player has weak reciprocity preferences, say they're at point A, then they will not contribute um, if regardless of what they believe other players are doing. So even when they believe other players will be fully contributing, or they observe that other players are fully contributing, this player will free ride. This makes sense. If they don't care very much about being reciprocal, they're not gonna contribute. And then we see that there's this um, switching point between um, free riding and so the social optimum when the reciprocity preferences become stronger. And we see that happen um, as um, the reciprocity preferences become stronger and we move into area three, um, further cooperative equilibria can be reached. And when we move into the indirect upstream reciprocity specification of the model, um, the utility maximization problem begins to look a little bit different. So I'm gonna take this piece by piece and recall that the upstream reciprocity case is looking at recent experience. So in this case, player J has received some monetary benefit or may have received some monetary benefit from the outcome of um, gameplay in set A. And that's captured in the material payoff function where they'd receive an additional payoff, some share of the group account. The direct reciprocity payoff function part B remains the same. And now part C is new, and this is the indirect reciprocity payoff function. Here we have an indirect reciprocity preference parameter. We have the player's um, kindness function. And now we have a perceived kindness function, which evaluates um, how kind player J perceives players in set A to be. So we now introduce gamma as a relative strength of direct to indirect reciprocity preferences where gamma is greater than zero. And when gamma is greater than one, then indirect reciprocity preferences are stronger than direct reciprocity preferences. And the converse is true when gamma is less than one. We're able to simplify the utility maximization problem. And uh, we now show that the history of the game lives in, in this term, which is player J's beliefs about what happens in set um, A. And this is something that player J observes the average contribution of. So we could exam examine three different cases for the history, um, like I previously showed. But in the interest of time, I'm going to show one of them. And we're going to look at the case where the history of the game is zero. So this means that player J has observed that the average contributions are zero. 
knows the certainty that everyone in set A contributed zero. And again, we see that when that American life about the white references are yeah, I've been listening to the whole. Could you, it's, it's if you're serial. if you're not presenting, could you please mute yourself? Please mute, you, you, please mute yourself if you're not presenting. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so here I'm showing when the uh, history of the game has been zero. So you've observed that, or player J has observed that others are not contributing to the group account. And I show that um, when reciprocity preferences are weak, that the player will not contribute anything, even if they believe that others in their own group are fully contributing. And as reciprocity preferences become stronger, then we see that more cooperative outcomes can be reached. Cooperation increases as reciprocity preferences um, reach even further and say we're at point C in area two, then we get to a, um, a really cool switching point as well, where when player J believes that the others in their group are fully contributing, they will only free ride if their indirect reciprocity preferences are strong enough. And otherwise, they will fully contribute and they'll be at the social optimum. Um, I think this result is pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and I'd love to share more with you about the other cases, but I'm going to move on to the downstream reciprocity case. Four and a half minutes, Emily. Yep. So when we look at indirect downstream reciprocity, this is when we're interested in the reputation-based effects. So how player J um, evaluates the reputation of the players in set A. And um, part A and part B of the utility maximization problem is the same as the baseline um, and direct reciprocity um, setups where the material payoff and direct reciprocity payoffs look the same. But now in part C, their indirect reciprocity function looks slightly different. We again have their indirect reciprocity preference parameter, Ri. We have an evaluation of their kindness um, towards players in their own group, and we have an evaluation of their perceived kindness of the players in set A towards this third party beneficiary. Again, we introduce gamma, the relative strength of direct to indirect reciprocity preferences, and the same interpretations of gamma hold. So we're able to simplify and show that the history of the game lives in what player J has observed um, occurring as the average contributions of players in set A. And here we're going to look at the interior solution case when the history of the game is C. And the graph looks a little bit more complicated, but the structure is, is really similar and the intuition is, is the same. So when the uh, reciprocity preferences are quite weak, we see that the player will not contribute even if they believe that others in their group will be contributing. And as reciprocity preferences become stronger, we see this, um, that the, um, not contributing remains um, potential equilibria, but also this seemingly altruistic equilibrium shows up. And we also see that as uh, these reciprocity preferences continue to become stronger, that these cooperative equilibria um, become potential um, outcomes, including the social optimum. So in conclusion, I hope that I've uh, what I hope with this paper is that we show reciprocity preferences matter and that including them um, can lead to outcomes that are not predicted by traditional game theory and also that the relative strength of these reciprocity preferences matter and both recent experience and reputation can drive behavior. Um, I'm really excited to test these theoretical predictions using economic experiments hopefully in the coming months um, and I'd just like to thank you all for your attention and this opportunity to present and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, you uh, you did well. You had two more minutes, so we have a uh, we have uh, two 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 extra minutes for questions. So excellent. If there are any excellent. If there <laughs> if there are any questions for Emily, um, please uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself and and ask the questions. Uh, we we have about thirty people, so hopefully. Uh, we won't run into any uh, issues, people talking over each other. But if you have questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. This is Samanti. I can ask, I don't know if others had their hands raised up, but if they did not, I can ask a question. So uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about the, so you, uh, the, the, the nature of the timing of the decisions, that is something which is pretty uh, neat. Mm -hmm. So we specify four different kind of 
models, I guess. So we have a simultaneous baseline game where players are making their decisions at the same time. So they're forming beliefs about what others will do in that case. And then in the direct reciprocity specification, there are an n minus one set of players that are again making their simultaneous contribution decision. And then there's the second mover, the player that we're interested in, that is observing the average contributions of those players and then making their contribution choice. So that's explicitly sequential. And then when we move into the indirect reciprocity specifications, there's a combination of simultaneous and sequentiality. So a player will observe the outcome of a simultaneous game and then go and play a simultaneous game with another set of players. And that happens in both the upstream and downstream cases. I have a follow-up question, but I will hold off and give others a chance. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a quick question, unless someone else wants to jump in. I'll go, go for it. Go ahead, ask your um, question. So I'm kind of curious, given that you are really um, interested in actor J, um, in terms of putting this into an experimental, um, implementing it in an experiment, are you going to try and measure actor J's uh, reciprocity preferences directly so that you have more information to assess what her or his behavior, whether that's actually an indication of reciprocity or not? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, uh, we've thought about a few ways to do that, because right now we're thinking that they walk into the room with their preference parameters, and we thought maybe, can we elicit that in some way with the survey, some post-experiment questions? Um, those are things that we're still ironing out in terms of how to run the experiments. Um, I'm learning um, all about this and having tons of fun. Um, but that's probably the best answer I can give right now. I'm sorry. No, absolutely. Can I ask a question, Mike? Absolutely, go for it. So um, uh, I'm curious to know the reason that you focused only on one actor, J, rather than looking at all the three people in the other group. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about the motivation for that choice? Mm -hmm. That's a great question too. Um, I think that when we look particularly at the direct reciprocity specification, um, we can only look at one player um, because of the timing of the game in that way. Um, so one player just has more information. And um, the same thing occurs when we look at um, the indirect cases. One player receives almost an additional treatment before going into the group. Um, so there's the potential, I think, with the indirect upstream case to treat all players going into the group. But when it comes to the indirect downstream case, I don't think that we could treat all players because we're pulling some of those players from a previous set um, to get to that reputation-based effect. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I think of it right now. But I think that's a, a great question for me to think about a little bit more too. Thank you. Monty, it makes it very difficult to do it experimentally. Um, so we, we have the experiments a little bit in mind too, because if you add more players, you add more complexity there too. But we thought sure. about that. Sure, and that can definitely be like a baseline. And once you got that, then you can probably think of other, adding in other players. Yep. I, can I jump in again? I, I'm kind of curious in terms of have you, um, decided already how you're going to determine group A in, in terms of, it, you'll probably see a lot of variation there too. Mm. Um, and trying to control that in terms of what um, individual J observes. I'm, I'm kind of curious if you, because that, yeah, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, are, are you thinking experimentally? Like, mm. yeah, yeah, so um, that, that's where we're hoping with the specification of the different histories, we'll be able to capture some of that. So when the history of the game is zero, nobody's contributing anything. That's the traditional public goods Nash equilibrium that we expect. Um, but quite often, what I think we see experimentally is that people are contributing at least something. So we're hoping that by including a history of the game um, C, where it's anywhere between zero and Y, that we're able to derive some predictions that maybe capture that um, fuzzy space where some people are contributing something. I hope. I, I think this will be a really interesting experiment. I, I think this is going to be 
this is really neat. Thanks. Awesome. Do we have any other questions? If not, um, feel free to still ask your question right now. I'm going to ask Emily to stop sharing and have um, Asan, who's going to go second, um, uh, start sharing his slides. Thanks, everyone. Right, thanks. Thanks very much, Asan. Um, there were no further questions, so you're uh, you're good to go. Can't really hear you right now. Asan, uh, you're still muted. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon, everyone. So my, I'll be talking about uh, the common pool resource, so coordination in the in the in the common the common pools of environmental uncertainty. This paper is uh, co-authored by Dr. Leah from Forster University of Delaware and Jordan Suter from Colorado State University. So this is the outline of my paper. I'll not talk about it. So I'll jump into the introduction, the background. And common pool resources involve, so threshold effects, that means that uh, extraction beyond certain point leads to disaster, disastrous consequences, such as depletion of uh, fish, fish stock, fishery stock, or salinity in the aquifer, or biodiversity loss, and Presence of such, uh, I, I mean, a challenge uh, is amplified when the tipping point threshold is uncertain. So there are two types of uns uh, uncertainty about threshold, in uh, uncertainty in its level and in its distribution. And since the uh, CPR use in, uh, is related to individuals' uh, uh, extraction behaviors, there are therefore individuals' attitudes and coupled with environmental uncertainty uh, uh, is makes the CPR management more complicated. In order to improve uh, our behavioral outcome, there has been a recent strand of literature, one that attempts to investigate the role of communication in changing certain choices toward a desired uh, outcome. Uh, so the external literature, uh, uh, one, uh, one uh, examining the effects of uncertainty, one CPR use is by mere comparing the outcomes in decision-making process uh, with and without uncertainty. But there are two types of uncertainty that, that remains. Uh, are you advancing uh, your slides? We don't see Sorry. your slides. We don't Hassan, see your slides are you, changing. Are you advancing your slides or are you still on the first slide? Okay. Can you hear, can you see it now? Yes, we can see see the second slide, introduction slide now. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, there are two types of uh, un uncertainty involved uh, that, uh, that is not discussed in mostly in uh, CPR literature, uh, is that range of potential threshold levels and the likelihood of those threshold levels occurring. So uh, past st studies uh, mostly focus on uh, 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 and, and discuss the presence of uncertainty that leads to collective action failure is based on uh, the uh, uncertainty when the probability distribution of the thresholds is uh, known. But little is uh, known about the CPR use when the threshold probability distribution are unknown, which we call the ambiguity in the later case. And when the probability is known, we call it uh, risk. And as we, I mentioned that communication is an important factor in changing one's uh, choices to our desired direction. In this backdrop, uh, we, ask, uh, we seek answers to the following questions uh, that do threshold uncertainties increase resource use compared to certainty about threshold and hence more likely to cause resource collapse. And how individuals' uh, attitudes toward uncertainty are related to common pool resource if, use. Excuse me, and and finally, we also uh, uh, investigated whether communication can improve the coordination among users in case of CPR use. 
So we, uh, uh, I, I, I will talk briefly about the basic model that we will be using. So we are is, is still following, uh, we're following the very basic model uh, that is uh, built on both the SKU et al. and Rappoperens Lehman, which is uh, later modified in literature. Uh, in the uh, C CPR game, under the presence of uncertainty, uh, there are n number of uh, individuals with risk preference, uh, and uh, the uh, uncertainty is represented by the threshold. Uh, I mean, the resource available to the group uh, R tilde, which is unknown, and the uh, since R tilde is unknown, in some cases, the probability distribution of the resource uh, uh, threshold is known. In some cases, it is unknown to the uh, uh, users in the group, which changes the uh, uncertainty about the threshold uh, and labeled as Fi. And we uh, we make certain assumptions is that uh, our, uh, the total uh, I mean, threshold, R tilde has a finite support and unlike uh, existing literature that uh, focus on the range of thresholds uh, with uh, continuity in the, within the range, we focus on discrete uh, thresholds. So we focus on three possible thresholds, alpha, gamma, and beta, and with equal probability. We further assume that rationality and rule of the game are common knowledge. And since uh, players are competing for using common uh, resource, each player's payoff depends on four factors. One is own extraction, total resource extraction by the rest or other users in the group, R RI, and the realization of the resource threshold, which is uncertain in the time the decision is uh, made. And the result, excuse me, the resulting threshold risk function, function H, which define the amount of the payoff received by each person once the threshold is exceeded. In, in case of sensitive resources, H is uh, uh, zero. That means that when uh, threshold is exceeded, then non, uh, each of the group member gets nothing. Uh, therefore, uh, in uh, using common pool resource in this type of setting, there are uh, two types of uncertainties involved in maximizing one's payoff. One is strategic uncertainty, and the other one is environmental uncertainty. Strategic uncertainty is related to the first two of the four factors, and the environmental uncertainty is related to the later two of the factors. So, we uh, since we talk about both the risk when the threshold probability is known and ambiguity when the threshold probabilities are unknown, in case of risk, uh, we use uh, uh, assume that uh, power utility function where rho is the individuals constant relative risk aversion uh, parameter. There are possible, uh, uh, these are the three possible uh, symmetric Nash equilibria as the game is symmetric. There are possible, uh, when of course there are other uh, asymmetric Nash equilibrium as well that depends on these factors. And in case of ambiguity where there is no study that em empirically uh, investigate the effect of ambiguous, ambiguous threshold on CPR use, we build on a flaggy and argue that the ambiguous threshold uh, reduces the CPR use. And the intuition behind is that the uh, uh, participants uh, uh, weight, uh, put a more higher weight on the uh, probabilistically damages of uh, uh, exceeding the threshold. As a result, they, they become conservative and, uh, uh, and use less or claim less tokens or resource. In, uh, in experimental designs, in our experiment, there are two stages involved in our experiment. First stage involves uh, risk and ambiguity elicitation task. In this stage, participants responded to a series of questions uh, that reveals their choice between a lottery with certain probability and an increased share amount in each successive choice. And uh, we'll see in the next slide. And the second stage of the game involves the participants' common pool resource game. That, may, uh, that where participants made choices in a series of uh, 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 rounds that in the presence of threshold uncertainty in the corresponding treatment group. So in the first stage, uh, we follow uh, the uh, uh, Akai et al, uh, their framework to uh, conduct that risk and ambiguity elicitation task. Uh, this is a, like an example where the participants had like option uh, either to choose option A or option B. They are, um, uh, provided with 20 options 
an option A, the lottery was rem uh, remained fixed with, uh, in case of risk elicitation task, the probability of uh, prizes were 50-50 with uh, winning zero or $100 if they can uh, uh, guess the color of ball. And in option B, there, uh, there is a sure amount. So participant, it is expected that participants will choose option A in the beginning of the choices and eventually they will switch to option B and that switching point will uh, reveal their certain equivalent uh, uh, amount uh, that will uh, help us in measure risk and ambiguity ad attitudes. We use the same, same framework for uh, ambiguity uh, elicitation task, but the difference was that the probabilities were remain unknown in case of uh, 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 ambiguity elicitation task. So we use uh, again the power utility for, uh, uh, to measure this uh, row and the following, uh, this is the equation that we use for measuring ambiguity attitude. This is the experimental design in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in a table for, format that in the first uh, panel is the risk and uh, ambiguity elicitation, elicitation task. Uh, each participant uh, performed these two tasks that was uh, randomly ordered and uh, random order for each person. And in the second stage, in the CPR game, there are three between treatment uh, certainty, in which case uh, the threshold was known for 100, uh, and threshold was 100, and risk and ambiguity. There are two other uh, treatments. Those are uncertainty about the threshold, in, uh, in, this, in which case there are three possible thresholds, uh, 50, 100, and 150, in case of risk, the threshold probabilities are one third for each, which is unknown in case of uh, uh, ambiguity. And the participants uh, 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 were allowed in to communicate in certain part of the game and uh, were not allowed in other part of the game that was uh, in, in certain sessions. So they're uh, within uh, treatment communication for eight rounds. Theoretical prediction. So we, in case of certainty treatment, the uh, threshold is 100 for sure for, with known. Uh, so symmetric equilibria is 1667. In case of risk treatment, there are many equilibria, but the three possible such, uh, symmetric Nash equilibria are these 833s and 667 and 1667 and 25. But the realization of these uh, Nash equilibria depends on the factors as mentioned. Uh, as I mentioned that these four factors, as we see uh, the best response functions uh, uh, for risk treatment that are uh, related to uh, associated with different risk preference. As we see that in case of uh, extreme risk aversion, rho equal 0.1, uh, there are possibly, uh, there are three possible uh, uh, symmetric Nash equilibria, A, B, C, A is uh, indicated for 8.33 B is for 16.67 and C is for 25. As a, as a risk, a risk preference increases, that means that individuals become less risk averse, that the possibility of lower SNE goes away. And as the person become risk neutral or risk loving, there, uh, there remains only one possible symmetric natural equilibria, which is 25. So- uh, risk, Five minutes, uh, Sasan, five minutes. Okay, so we hypothesize that the threshold uncertainty raised token claims related to the case when thresholds are known. Individuals risk uh, aversion coupled with threshold uncertainty is associated with reduced token claim and reduced likelihood of resource collapse. Communication improves the resource management by leading to lower CPR use and less incidence of resource collapse involved. So a total of 318 students participated uh, that was conducted in uh, University of Delaware. Uh, in say, spring, summer, and fall semesters. Uh, so before we jump into the CPR results, these are the uh, results about attitudes toward uncertainty. The majority of participants are risk and ambiguity averse, as we see, and uh, the relation between risk and ambiguity is positive for risk averse participants, which remains uh, unrelated when individuals are risk loving. And averse token claim, uh, so individuals made token claim in 16 rounds in experiment, uh, eight rounds in, with the first group and they were a randomly uh, formed group. And in before beginning of ninth round, they were regrouped. So 
the token claim, uh, oh, average token claim was highest in uh, risk treatment uh, before without communication uh, and also after communication, but communication improves uh, token claim in all treatment, but most, most effective was in case of uh, ambiguity treatment. As we see that uh, the density of uh, token claims before communication and with communication, you see that the uh, range uh, range of uh, uh, range of token claim uh, narrowed down very much after communication uh, in all treatment. So this is summary of all the treatment uh, all, uh, for all treatments token claim, and uh, we see that the the difference between uh, average token claim uh, between all treatments that uh, average token claims are higher in case of threshold uncertainty is statistically significant. Uh, and this also uh, lowers the likelihood of resource collapse as well. In order to understand uh, or in a, a systematically analyze the effect of threshold uncertainty, we uh, applied a random effect logistic regression, sorry, random effect regression for uh, threshold, uh, sorry, for token claims uh, with uh, different uh, treatment variables and related variables. We see that the key variables are risk and ambiguity. These are the uh, treatment variable. And we see that the uh, risk treatment increases significantly the token claim, even though ambiguity is not significant, but joint test of hypothesis uh, shows that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 threshold uncertainty, to token claim in case of threshold uncertainty is different from token claim in case of like, certainty. So, uh, uh, in case of uh, when communication is introduced, it improves greatly, significantly uh, for uh, coordination in case of uh, risk and ambiguity. The most effective, uh, again, uh, was for ambiguity treatment. Uh, individual at attitude, we see these two uh, uh, variables are not significant. So individual attitudes are not influence, uh, influential in uh, affecting uh, token claim, but uh, uh, individual attitude in risk treatment uh, was significant and it reduces a uh, token claim relative to certain certain treatment. We also uh, estimated the likelihood of uh, resource collapse, resource collapse uh, using uh, and that is uh, if they are affected by threshold uncertainty and use the log uh, random effect logic model and we f see that treatments risk and ambiguity are not significant, uh, but the communication improves greatly in all treatment that as the, after com initiating communication, it, uh, it uh, lo lowered the likelihood of uh, resource collapse or groups exceeding the threshold. And in, excuse me. One minute to sound. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and that is the and summary. Threshold uncertainties raise token claims compared to the case when threshold is known with certainty and individuals attitudes toward uncertainty do not influence uh, the token claim. And however, risk attitude reduce token claim in risk treatment related to the certainty. And finally, communication is very effective in reducing token claim and reducing the likelihood of resource collapse in all treatment. And I'm um, here for any questions you have, thank you. Thank you very much, Asan. Really appreciate uh, your talk and uh, sharing your paper with us. Um, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and uh, ask Asan any questions you may have. I'll I'll jump in. Um, Really uh, interesting project, nice presentation. Um, I was curious about two uh, effects of your regressions that you mentioned. One was, do you know if the um, coefficient for the, the table before that, mm -hmm. do you know if the coefficient for certainty and risk, are those significantly different in terms of how, um, communi uh, how communication uh, improves it? So are you talking, uh, are you asking, um, minus one. Yes, exactly. All right. Do you know if those are significantly different? Yes, the communication is uh, uh, when communication is introduced, 
whether these two coefficients are different? That's the question. Yes. So uh, uh, it, it, you, you might not have um, tested for that yet, but I think that would be a really neat result yeah. if it was, um, just in terms of being able to mm -hmm. say that communication might be more effective in in cases of ambiguity or uncertainty rather than risk. I, th I think that would be an added facet that I would find interesting. Um, and then yeah. what I was curious about as well is that, so in, in, in this. Do you want me to make it bigger, larger? Uh, so, no, actually, um, no, I can see it. So. Um, Communication doesn't seem to have an impact on um, extraction in in the case of certainty. Correct? Yeah, they are already uh, around sixteen. Looks mm -hmm. like that. But in your following in your following um, regression, you actually find that communication has a positive oh, or positive effect on reducing the likelihood of resource collapse. And I'm. Yeah. Um, I, I think it would be really interesting in the paper just to, um, if you are able to sort of parse that out a little bit and explain why it doesn't actually change extraction rate, but changes likelihood of resource collapse. I think, again, that would, that would be an interesting nuance, um, I would think. Mm -hmm. So it's more, more comments than questions, really. Thank you, Ursula. Um, we have time for one more question, if there's one more question out there. Can I ask a question? This is Samanti. Go ahead. Um, so I am, uh, I, can you just talk a little bit about how you implemented the communication treatment and a follow up to that, why did you make it a within subject treatment versus a between subject treatment? Can you talk a little bit about motivations for your choice? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So the communication was, uh, so in the form of uh, unstructured chat, so participants were within, uh, so each participant was part of a group. So they were able to communicate with their other group members. Uh, randomly, but they, they, they didn't know the participants' ID, identification. It's totally, completely anonymous. And uh, so why, I guess there was the... Uh, looks, like, looks like we lost you, Asan. You were cutting out. Shamanti, can you, is it just me or is, is he, is he gone? I think he is gone. Okay. It's good. It's good timing that he's gone now. I mean, we, we managed to get through the presentation just fine. So that's good, good timing. I'd say, sorry, Asan, you cut out. Sorry. I'm going to have you, that's okay. You want to finish up your thought real quick? Yeah. Right, so can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, I think uh, so. The communication was uh, in that in that form that nobody knows about the identity of the other group members. Uh, okay, it looks like we're losing Asan again. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it here. I'm gonna have Shamanti and Asan connect after this talk. Um, could you uh, could you stop good. sharing? <laughs> could you stop sharing um, your screen? Hassan, so I can uh, yeah. start uh, start sharing mine. Um, do we um, do we have a volunteer? Uh, can somebody, uh, Emily or Ursula, um, can somebody take my time um, and give me cues? On it. That'd be great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Emily. Okay, um, let me share my screen. Is that coming through okay for everyone? Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you, um, everyone, again, for being here. My name is Mike Kosinski. I'm an assistant professor at the University of uh, Delaware. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about this paper I've been working on for some time with my friend Jacob Fuchs, who's an economist at uh, Cigna. Uh, the paper is called The Strategic Effects of Climate Variability on Environmental Damage and Protective Investment. Uh, for the outline, pretty traditional, I do a little bit of uh, introduction, which is mostly motivation. I'm going to skip. Um, really all of the literature because there's no time. Um, I want to focus on um, introducing the climate competition model, which is what this paper is, is about, and then talk um, mostly also skip the experimental design uh, for time reasons and talk about the results specifically focusing on the difference between the prediction that came out of our model and then the observed behavior from the experiments. And then um, after that, I want to talk about uh, treatment differences, specifically um, one particular uh, difference between two of the treatments that we introduced. And then there'll be a, a short conclusion if there's time, if that, Emily hasn't cut me off at that point. Um, so a uh, big picture before I get started, uh, what we do is we introduce a dynamic two-player competition model, which we call climate competition model, uh, and then we test that model experimentally. Um, to that model, then we add climate variability in form of four behavioral treatments. Um, the most important results that sort of came out of this is that, number one, the model does a pretty good job in predicting actual behavior. We do see quantitatively, we do, we do see behavioral differences, but overall, as you will see, qualitatively, the, the, the model does a pretty good job explaining behavior. The second result is that tipping point threshold level level or uh, levels that we'll introduce in in this model um, when these thresholds trigger a constant and known increase in environmental damage, it changes behavior. It makes individuals more competitive in that it leads them to produce more output, which also leads them to produce more environmental damage and um, leads to higher payoffs. And then tipping point threshold levels, so the same threshold that I, I um, talked about in number two, um, if that threshold increases stochastic variability, um, and I'll talk about what all of this means here in a moment, that results in a different type of behavior in that people become less competitive, they produce less output, they produce less pollution because of that, but they also make lower payoffs, and there's a specific reason why they make lower payoffs, and I'll show that in a moment. Okay, so a little bit of motivation. Um, Jacob and I started thinking about this paper, we really had climate change in mind, and in many ways, that's all I think about. Um, and so the idea was, well, if we have government failure to protect us all, to fail to, to reach these globally binding climate agreements, then much of that burden, like climate change is not going away, but much of that burden, that burden um, will be impacting individual decision makers. And the reason why we think that's particularly important now, or you know, even, even more urgent now, is because of uh, a bunch of reports that sort of have, have come out of from, from the IPCC lately. Specifically, if you remember, if you follow that literature in 2018, there was a special report on global warming, wherein the IPCC showed that we might reach levels of 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming by 2030, which is very, very different from what we've seen in, um, in for instance, the fifth assessment report from 2014, where they were still talking about 2100. So these are dramatic changes that, that really are called to action. So there's increased urgency. And the reason why it's so important to understand these levels is because we know that at levels as low as 0 0.5 degrees of warming, uh, again, uh, we're talking about uh, compared to pre-industrial levels. Uh, we see an increase in intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. I just we just had a thousand-year um, rain event um, go down, go through through Wilmington. It's incredible. Anyway, uh, I've got to stay on time here. Um, lots to cover. Okay, uh, and we know that at 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming, these levels are associated with important threshold levels at which point then the negative implication just grows so much larger and certainly will have impact on sustainable development and really um, drive poverty. So that's why, you know, we really need to be concerned about these things. Okay, Bill Nordhaus said that without sanctions against non-participants, there are no stable coalitions other than those with minimal abatement. And that's exactly what Jacob and I are trying to address here. What happens 
if individuals are left with the negative or with the impacts of, of climate change. So we're asking two questions here. How does climate change variability impact individual behavior in dynamic competitive decision environments? And then to that, we add, uh, these are our treatments, how do threshold levels impact individual behavior? And I'll go straight to the, uh, to the objective function, straight to the model. What we see here is that, and this is what we call our climate competition model, wherein um, individual, I, individual I seeks to maximize payoffs over time. Um, so we have an objective function up here, and the two choice variables that, that individual I has are X, which is the amount of output a, uh, individual I can produce in any given time period, and VI in time period T, or new I, uh, which is the amount of uh, uh, protective infrastructure investments. Now, why does the individual have to make protective infrastructure investments? Well, it's because of this component of the payoff function. So we'll look at this now. The first part of that function is just revenue, price times quantity. We assume price is constant, exogenously determined. Um, so uh, XI is the amount of output times the price. So that's just revenue. Minus the costly infrastructure investments. That's right here. And the reason why an individual might want to protect themselves or invest into costly infrastructure is because of the environmental damage that's created. So that's this next term right here, which is a scaled um, environmental damage component. And you see that there's no subscript I. So that's the, uh, that's the public component. That's a public bad. So the more output the individuals create, the more revenues they make, but also the more environmental damage they create that impacts everyone. Lastly, we have the amount of existing of effective infrastructure that's protecting against that environmental damage. Uh, it's a constraint uh, dynamic optimization model and the most important um, constraints are the first two here, which are the state equations. That's where the dynamics live. We'll look at that on the next slide, what that looks like. So the first one is the uh, infrastructure which consists of the previous rounds, the, depre the depreciated infrastructure from the previous round, plus the new influx of infrastructure from this round. The environmental damage um, is the pre-existing environmental damage. It's dissipated. We assume that nature has some ability to reduce that environmental damage over time, plus then the new um, environmental damage that's created through production in this period. And then the last component, which is the important, so the key piece to, and this is where our treatments live, this is this phi, and this phi adds variability, and that's our treatments. I'll talk about that more when I get to the experimental design. For now, the important thing to know is that um, the mean of this phi is zero. So we assume risk neutrality in this model. So whatever happens here with phi, it doesn't change the theoretical outcome. But it does change your behavior, as we'll see when we talk about the experimental outcomes um, in a moment. Uh, the other constraints are pretty straightforward. We have that the amount of money the individual spends on protective infrastructure has to be smaller or equal to the revenue. Um, there's an upper limit of what participants can produce. In the experiments, that was 10. And the effective infrastructure has to be smaller or equal to the damage. So it can't be larger. It can't add to the profit. And then XI, VI, and II, they're all non-negative. Okay, I'm gonna jump up a bunch of steps, mathematical steps on how to solve this because this is just numbers. So I'm, I'm gonna jump straight to the dynamics. Um, we solved this particular game for a simultaneous choice game and for a sequential choice game. Both of these are very, very similar. And this particular slide has already been, um, has already received the parameters that we used in the experiment. So this is the theoretical prediction for the experiment. And we see income, income is constant at 14 in each period. Uh, this is in dollars. And what we see the theoretical prediction to be is that in the beginning, we see um, a lot of investment as we go down this curve, a lot of investment into protective infrastructure, it sort of converges towards just about $3. Um, uh, that's just to offset uh, the environmental damage that's created. So you front load investment, 
which also means that at the beginning, profits are pretty low, but as protective investment comes down over time, we see profits rise and converge towards uh, just about 11, just over 11. So these are theoretical predictions of what will should be the outcome, what we anticipate the outcome given our model should be, at least a simultaneous choice outcome. And similarly, here's the sequential choice game where we have first and second mover, and you see the, the predictions are the same. We have a slight difference here between first and second mover in the beginning, but they converge to exactly the same outcome over the rounds. Okay, uh, as I said, I have to skip a bunch of things because we need to get to the results. And uh, so we had four behavior treatments. Um, those were all between subject, and then the within subject variation was uh, between simultaneous choice game and sequential choice game. Each participant uh, played two simultaneous and two sequential choice games with different partners. And then four different treatments, which is what I will talk about now. So the, four treat the first treatment that we had was what we called the linear deterministic treatment. In this particular treatment, an increase in output led to a proportional increase in environmental damage. So it was a linear function and people knew if they produced more output, this was what the, with certainty, this was what the environmental damage and the cost was going to be. The second treatment, we called our IID error treatment. In that particular treatment, an increase in output led to a linear increase in environmental damage, so just like before, but now there is, we add a variability. So we, we put an error term on this, which sort of fluctuated around, it's like an error band around that linear damage function. Um, and so we added that in treatment number two. Treatment number three, we call threshold drift. So this treatment starts out just like the, the first treatment, linear deterministic, but for each round, and here's where the thresholds come in. For each round, the damage hit 45 units of damage, an additional two units of pollution was added automatically. So for every round, they hit that threshold. Um, um, There's an additional two uh, units of pollution that was added. So they knew that with certainty. Treatment number four is what we call it threshold volatility. So this treatment starts out just like treatment number two with that error band around a linear uh, damage function. But now, once they hit that threshold of 45, that variability just spread. So all we told participants, that variability at the threshold level just went up dramatically. That was the only information that we gave participants. Okay, looking at results. Um, so this is sort of where, you know, as an experimental economist, this is where you always get excited. Right? This is sort of like a treat every time you look at this. And so we were really excited about what we found Overall, and on the left, you will see I have the SIM, SIM is simultaneous choice model, and SEQ uh, is sequential choice model, and I further split up into first and second mover down here. The prediction was for both models, the prediction was 10 units of production in each period, and what we found is pretty consistent throughout the models that participants produced eight units, or about eight units, the mean was pretty close to eight units which was about a 20% deviation. Um, so that's certainly significant. It's a significant deviation from our prediction. Um, but you remember I said that our model actually did a pretty good, pretty good job predicting what people would do. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if we look at the kernel density plot, we see that most participants actually, by far most participants, chose to play 10 units of output. And the mean is really driven by what we see on the left side here. Um, so the model does, at least qualitatively speaking, a pretty good job at explaining this. The same is true for the first and second mover. We see that by far most participants chose to produce 10 units of output. Okay, for the infrastructure, if you remember from the theoretical prediction, it was this nice curve that was sort of converging to just about three. Well, we actually we see that kind of, except for in period one, where the difference white, the white bars is the predicted and the black is the observed. In period one, there's a pretty big difference, a significant difference there between the predicted and the observed. But as we move down the rounds, we see that it actually converges quite nicely to that theoretical outcome. So we have that kind of curve that converges. And the same is true, even, you know, more perfectly, if you will, um, for the sequential choice model, we have that convergence towards the uh, prediction of just about three units or, uh, yes, infrastructure. 
uh, investment. Okay, moving on to the regression. Um, given the time that I have, there's a lot of interesting things that are going on here, but I wanna focus on one thing in particular, and that is the difference between the threshold treatments, so treatment three and treat treatment four. Uh, just because I practiced this talk a bunch of times and I wanted to talk about all the results, I couldn't. I always ran out of time. So I want to focus on this one. And that's the, the difference between down here, excuse me, the difference between treatment three and treatment four. We find that there's significant differences between these treatments and that, and that is consistent for all models. So the com combined model, so that's all data, simultaneous and sequential, and then that's consistent for the simultaneous choice model, for the sequential choice model. It's a pretty consistent story there. And what we find is that participants in treatment four produce significantly less output. So that's when there is that, that error band around that threshold widened dramatically uh, versus treatment three, where they knew exactly how much damage it would face. Now the theoretical prediction was the same for, for both, but what we found is that given that uncertainty, um, they produce significantly less output and, um, or in treatment four, they produce significantly less or in treatment three, they produce significantly more um, given, um, um, given, depending on the treatment they were in. Now, the interesting question then that would come next is what kind of impact did that have on their um, investment behavior. Do we see that because in treatment four, they produce less environmental damage, there was less of a need to, um, to, to put money into protective infrastructure. And that's not really what we found at all. It seemed like people were pretty confused. So when we look, so this is the regression output for investment behavior. And again, looking at this down here, this is marginally significant. I put an asterisk there. It's barely at the 10% level. So marginal, marginal at best, we find that people and participant or participants in treatment four put, okay, thanks Emily. Um, people in participant or in, in treatment four did produce less, but marginally so. So which all, which is really what was driving the, um, the, uh, the fact that the behavior was less efficient in even though they produced less environmental damage in that treatment, it, they, their behavior was overall less efficient. And we see that when we look at the, um, the payoffs. We see that participants in treatment three um, down here made, and we have a positive coefficient, which is highly significant, made significantly more money. And we see participants in treatment four, they produce less environmental damage. But because they overinvested into protective infrastructure, it seemed that uncertainty made them very worried about what might still happen so that they still put a lot of money into protective infrastructure. So they earned significantly less money because they put too much money into uh, protective infrastructure. So uh, I have to conclude. Let me sum it up maybe in my own words. I'm not going to read this. Uh, the interesting thing is what comes out of this is with that uncertainty around climate change, and that's what we're seeing, we really need to guide people in making appropriate decision. It's, it, we, you know, uncertainty might, um, with that uncertainty, with that bigger error band around the damage function, might create, you know, better environmental behavior um, by or producing less environmental damage, but it also produces a lot of uncertainty around how much money they should invest into protective infrastructure. And that's what we're seeing here. That's, I don't have any bigger conclusions. We need to look into this a lot more um, to make any really definite, draw any definite conclusions from this, but the behavior was really interesting to see. So um, thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take some questions. I think I'm out of time for sure, right, Emily? So I think we have about three or four minutes for questions. I have a question. Um, so 
essentially, would you say that treatment four is most akin to the situation that we're facing with climate change? I would think so. Yeah. I mean, it's a tricky question, right? I mean, even in treatment four, we had, there, there could have been a positive, right? I mean, we think of, when we think about climate change, we really think about climate change as something that's going to have a large and negative effect, right? But all of our treatments had a mean of zero, right? So we had, we had fluctuations around the mean that could have been positive or negative, right? So our assumptions, and that was for simplicity only. I mean, it was a pretty complex model because it was dynamic. It was really difficult to get. We spent like probably about 40 minutes or so to get people to trained in this and how to think about this. We had a program and so, um, so we made it simple in terms of, we're simpler in terms of what we needed to do about our assumptions. We assumed risk neutrality. We had a mean of zero for all of these. Re yes, in a way it's, climate change is uncertainty. It's a huge amount of uncertainty, but it mostly lives on the negative side, right? I mean, sure. If you're, if you're the producer of air conditioning units or if you're the producer of certain things, you, know, you, you might have, there might be some positive effects. Um, you know, maybe if you're living in certain areas, there used to be, the literature used to say that, you know, there could be some positive impacts in northern latitudes because of an increase in growing season, which is mostly bullshit because, um, because of the increase in extreme weather events. And so we know that that's probably not true, but... So you could be the beneficiary, but most likely we, we think that climate change is living on the negative side of things, right? So it's, yeah, there's, there's, it's not as realistic as I would want it to be. Sure, I mean, this is clearly has to be an abstraction given how complex uh, the climate change situation is. Um, I guess, I, so really, Based on this, would you forecast that we're going to see overinvestment and adaptation rather than actual um, investment in mitigation practices? So I, th I think we're going to see overinvestment by the rich and people that can afford it. Right? We're going to see people protect themselves. People that don't have the money, they're going to be the loser of this. Um, yeah. It's... It, there's there's a lot of complexity, but I, which I cannot tease out in this, right? No, of, of course. Sorry, um, so, so I think that we need to start moving on. Okay, <laughs> just a time. I just, Sorry, um, I want to make sure that Ursula has enough time for her presentation. Thank you. That's definitely appreciated. I just quickly wanted to um, say, how does that link up to sort of Barrett and, and Danberg's uh, work on sort of uncertain thresholds in, in climate games? And yeah, I, I so guess it's. So Astrid's work is, you know, sort of um, been on my mind a lot because it's really cool stuff. Um, her, so from, if I remember correctly, she shows that whenever there's uncertainty around thresholds, right? If those thresholds don't come with certainty and that, uncertain, that, that, that ambiguity grows, then we see, you know, behavior in public goods, right? I mean, she, they're really focused on public goods, contrib contributions to public goods. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're having a component, a public good component, but there's also a larger private component. So that interplay between what is good for the public versus what's good for me is sort of what's driving the behavior in, in this particular model. And given our theoretical pr predictions, we see that people become, are predicted to become very selfish. So you, you're going to make as much money as you can and use that money to protect yourself, build a bubble around yourself. And I would assume that rich people are already doing that. Yeah. You're, you're up, Ursula. Yes, I'm up. Um, I guess back to happier topics. <laughs> um, all right, actually, I'm just gonna share my external monitor, I think. Is that showing up okay? Uh, it's good. Yep. yep it's All right. Good. Okay. All right. So um, this is a project with uh, Samanti Banerjee um, here at University of Nebraska as well, and James Walker at um, Indiana. 
Um, it's really about environmental public goods provision and looking at how capacity or endowment can impact the ability and the likelihood of cooperative success. Um, and we vary that across different types of contributions. Um, so just to provide a little background, actually, let me just, not sure, is this uh, progressing? Okay, I can't really see it on the Zoom. It shows up good here. We can, we can see it fine. Okay, all right, I'll just keep moving. Um, all right, so just as a quick um, background, um, a lot of environmental public goods can be um, collectively provided. So just thinking about CO2 emission reduction, um, linking up to the last talk, just by individuals setting different thermostat settings. But um, that can also apply to a number of different types of environmental public goods, such as uh, reduction um, in terms of particular matter or, or biodiversity conservation in terms of um, private and voluntarily set uh, land set asides or tree planting campaigns. Um, <clears throat> in terms of environmental public goods, a lot of these involve non-linearities. So um, rather than the um, standard linear voluntary contribution me uh, mechanisms, um, they really exhibit factors such as ecological processes that require minimum land set-asides to actually manage to protect um, species or bio biophysical processes that um, dictate safe pollution levels. So really we have to look at some kind of non-linearities when we talk about um, environmental public goods. Um, and in addition to that, contributions to the public goods can take a number of different um, forms. They could be financial, such as um, increasing electricity costs by switching to green energy, or um, even though depending on where in the country you are, that might not be the case. Um, or it could be donating time and effort in terms of community tree planting projects. Or something. Uh, this gets us to the motivation and background here. Um, in these particular settings, so uh, collective action, non-linearities, and different modes of contributions, we really have very little understanding of um, how the ability or the capacity to contribute um, impacts um, cooperation and provision success. Um, so there are a number of studies that do look at capacity effects, but these tend to be in um, linear um, settings. Um, and when I talk a little bit about the incentive structure, it's clear that that doesn't quite apply here. Um, and yet those uh, findings are contradictory, um, such as Ostrom or, or Lori, and um, oftentimes the focus of capacity effects are really um, on heterogeneity, so within group um, variation of um, endowments and capacity rather than just um, across group uh, different endowment levels. Um, so why do we actually care about this? And just um, as a very high level um, motivation for this, it really is about, not that I would say that experimental findings should dictate public policy, but um, by having a better sense of how individuals react to, for instance, um, endowments or ability to contribute, we might be better able to target um, collective action campaigns in certain neighborhoods or um, cater for the, the different types of contributions and really decide which types of neighborhoods, which types of campaigns would be best served by some kind of some form of government intervention. All right, so um, we modeled these environmental public goods as a very straightforward um, threshold public goods game. So um, this is going to be non-linear and non-continuous. Um, and this is relatively straightforward in terms of there's a group of um, N individuals, and each individual I has to choose how much of um, their token endowment B they um, contribute towards a public good. Um, that contribution MI um, in combination with others is going to determine the payoffs. Um, for every token that is uh, remains in the private account, um, they receive a private um, payoff of P. Um, if the sum of all contributions to the public account meet or exceed a threshold level T, which is publicly known, um, each individual in the group receives a payoff of P, regardless of, of their contributions to, to the public good. Um, so 
what really determines the incentive structure, um, as I'll, I'll show later with the, with the Nash equilibrium, is um, what happens with tokens in excess of the threshold and what happens with, um, with tokens if groups don't meet the threshold. So in terms of um, excess or overshoot of the provision point, um, we structure this as no rebates, so um, all excess tokens are wasted. Um, this is a pretty common structure. Um, if you look at the meta-analysis um, by Croson and Marx, and um, it really allows us to focus on the coordination aspect of the provision point public goods. In terms of refund rules, so what happens when um, individuals don't meet the, um, the threshold, we use that and vary that to mimic some of the different types of contributions. We use full refund um, rules to mimic financial contributions um, such that um, a lot of donations, if they're pledged, they can be returned, and that's the case with a lot of financial campaigns, such as on kickstarter.com. Um, we use the no refund um, rule where all the, um, any tokens that um, are put towards the public good but don't meet the threshold are wasted um, to model or mimic the uh, incentive structure underlying um, donations of time or effort. So where, um, Generally, when, once you've exerted time, you can't really refund that. Um, this then, just very briefly, um, results in the, in the following incentive structures. Um, I've, I've put the payoffs here to the right for the full refund in blue and for the no refund in red with the Nash equilibria underlying those. Um, and as you can see, um, this is very different from the incentive structure um, from the linear public goods game, the VCM. And, um, results in a in a number of different Nash equilibrium. For the full refund, we're talking about um, a full range of Nash equilibrium between one and um, a number of, of group contributions where you yourself with your endowment can't make up the difference to the th threshold. Um, and then of course at the threshold level for the no refund, really we're only talking about a single um, uh, equilibrium at zero and another one at the threshold level. So which means that um, really in the full refund case we actually um, see that the Nash equilibrium range is related to the endowment structure um, was an indication that that should um, result in possible changes in behavior or at least in um, in coordination of, on the on, on um, an equilibrium strategy. All right, using these um, incentive structures, we um, implemented um, the following experiment. Um, we have individuals in groups of six, um, with the threshold being 120 tokens. We vary the endowment. Um, private return is one experimental currency, um, and the, the benefit is 60. Our um, experiment is in two parts. The first part is a venture game or a strategy method. Um, where each individual um, sees, sees um, has the ability to make contributions in four different endowment um, settings. So this is a, a within subject um, test for capacity effects. Um, and then in the second part, um, it's a repeated game where we have four different treatments, which is low capacity, full uh, refund, um, low capacity, no refund, high capacity, full refund, and high capacity, no refund. Um, and this um, is the between subjects portion of the experiment. We have 72 subjects per, um, per treatment for six groups, uh, sorry, for 12 groups per, per treatment. All right, so We have um, a range of preliminary results. We're still working on, on the data analysis, so this is still tentative. But essentially, what we're finding is that capacity is positively correlated with contributions and provision success. So this is, um, these are um, in the background, these are the number of tokens group contributions towards the public goods in the different um, endowment settings for the full refund and the no refund. Um, and in the front here in the white, um, these are the um, success um, probabilities or, or percentages. Um, and both of these increase and they are statistically significant using uh, Wilcox and uh, rank, uh, paired rank sum tests. Um, so 
the reason, um, and, and the paper goes in more detail, um, we, we suggest that there is going to be a capacity effect is as, um, as capacity or endowment increases, um, the minimal coalition size, so the number of individuals needed to actually um, successfully provide the public good decreases. Um, and based on randomization, we're expecting similar proportions of behavioral types, um, so such as conditional cooperators, altruists, um, and others um, pointed out by Fischbacher et al. Um, across the groups. So as endowments increase and um, minimal coalition sizes decrease, where the expectation becomes that you'll have sufficient number or you're more likely to have sufficient number of um, of contributors in, in a given group to actually meet successfully meet the provision point. Um, this is less, um, this capacity effect is less clear in the repeated game um, where you get um, expectations arisen from a previous round behavior. But overall, we see uh, the dotted lines here are low endowments, the, the solid lines are high endowments. We see um, differences there as well in terms of um, high endowment um, groups being more likely, not just con contributing more, but also being more likely to actually um, meet the, the threshold. And um, there is, however, a difference between the different um, refund settings or contribution types in, in our model um, in, within the repeated games. So this is a um, OLS and a random effects um, with period dummies and um, clustered at the group level. Just um, very straightforward regression in terms of um, individual contributions with dummies for the different um, treatments. And by looking at some joint significance tests, we see that the, um, there is a capacity effect so there's a significant difference between uh, low and high capa um, capacity in the full refund, but not in the no refund um, setting. Ursula, I'm not sure if so, you saw your five minutes. Okay, five minutes. that shouldn't okay. be a problem at all. Um, so this, this might give us an indication, we need to dig into these results um, a little more, um, but this might give an indication in terms of where um, to to target what types of neighborhoods, what kind of back, um, backgrounds to target with um, with effort versus um, financial campaigns, um, and then there's just a number of um, preliminary or analyses still pending that we're looking at currently that we're not going to be able to get into here. But um, looking at convergence effects on the threshold, and we see very different behavior um, based on the refund um, refund structure with um, no refund converging towards the zero in Nash equilibrium while the, the full refund is converging on the, um, the actual socially optimal threshold uh, level Nash. Uh, we're also looking at um, distribution or differences in contributions uh, within each group in terms of identifying different um, behavioral types um, such as individuals that just increase their contribution levels with increases in, in endowments of the menu game, um, which might be an indication more of some, um, some kind of anchoring bias rather than, than, a, um, than the minimal coalition um, theory. But uh, as of yet, we still have to dig into that. Um, and that just uh, concludes this very brief overview of, of this presentation. Thank you very much, Ursula, uh, for your interesting talk. Um, we have a, we're over, it's 1.30, but we're gonna take a few minutes here to, uh, to open it up for questions. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself and then go ahead and ask Ursula your question. Hi, Okay, nobody has a question. I'm gonna ask a question. Um, so can you help me out, Ursula? I'm, I'm trying to think of um, some you know, potential application. I mean, you were asking me about climate change. I'm just gonna hand it back mm -hmm. to you. Can you give me a potential application for what you're trying to address? Have you thought about that? 
So um, a lot of this would come down to um, local um, donation campaigns or local fund uh, fundraising to provide some kind of environmental um, public good, such as um, local tree planting campaigns, for instance. So this is this is very much more at the at the local level um, and getting individuals engaged there and what results in in greater contributions or cooperation. Do we have any other questions? Okay, so uh, we have no further question. I know people are, we've lost a few people. We're at 132, I know we're two minutes over. Um, and uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna conclude right now. I'm, I'm sure if you wanted to reach out to us individually through email, um our names are listed on the program i think i'm not sure you'll find it on the aaea AAE way aaea website i'm sure um feel free to reach out to us um uh again thanks to seaway and xecon if you haven't signed up uh, to be a member of those sections go ahead and, and click that uh check box to be a member of those great sections um, and again, we'd like to thank Seaway and XECON for sponsoring this session, and we'd like to thank all of you for being part of this today. Um, and so thanks to the presenters and thanks to the audience, and um, it was good seeing everyone. We're done. <laughs> nice job, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Well, thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. See you.